As many of you may or may not know, I've been using the Audio-Technica ATLP60 turntable for the majority of my vinyl listening needs. Unfortunately, since this is an automatic turntable, however, it makes it very difficult to queue up records live on the air when I happen to do my live streaming music shows. So while this is a very, very decent turntable for the price that you pay, I've wanted to upgrade to something a bit more advanced for quite some time now. And so I just so happened to be in the right place at the right time when I came across this ION model TT USB, USB turntable. It is a manual turntable. It has no mechanical, it has no automatic system in place. So much the same way as a regular DJ turntable, you simply place the stylus on and start and stop the playback of the vinyl LPs or 45s manually. And this model has been out for a few years. I think it was released and manufactured new sometime around 2009, 10, or even 2011. So it's really not that old of a model. It has plug and play USB connectivity, adjustable anti skate control, 33 and a third and 45 RPM speed playback. Supports even, and it even supports recording of 78 RPM media through the included software. Of course, you don't want to use the included stylus you'll wear it out and it's not suitable for playing back 78s, but you can do it. I guess you need to play it at either 33 and a third or 45 RPMs and then adjust the speed in the software that they include. And it does have line level RCA outputs and you can switch on or disable the built-in preamp much the same way you can with my ATL P60. And it has an eighth inch stereo line input jack for whatever reason. I was under the impression originally that this this jack right over here was a headphone jack for queuing up your music, but apparently that is not the case with this turntable. Now just a quick note, this is a refurbished turntable, so it's probably going to differ slightly from the new models, if you can even buy them brand new at this late point in the game. But uh, it's pretty much the same exact sort of uh, standard fare that you would get with any, uh, any turntable, much the same with the ATLP60 that I had purchased. Just telling us a warning here about the small accessories that could get lost and attention windows vista users well that goes without saying we have the platter well the uh, turntable slip mat here which is in this piece of plastic I don't believe that this is actually a branded mat oh yes it is with the ION logo and it's actually in decent condition not all dusty and removing this top cover should reveal the actual meat and potatoes of this turntable and we have a cardboard insert. I'm going to have a mess to clean up on the floor pretty soon. Unfortunately, the platter for this turntable is plastic. This is not a uh, this is not an aluminum platter like the ATLP60, which is unfortunate because it does help to mitigate the rumbling noise that can make its way into your vinyl recordings if you happen to walk around or or anything like that because the magnetic cartridges that are in use on these turntables are very susceptible to picking up vibrations and rumbling and uh, very low pitched rumbling sounds that are not very noticeable but if you look at the waveform and audacity or any kind of an audio editor it will be very plain to see that it's picked up some noise that's uh, unwanted so this is the turntable in the actual styrofoam packaging we have the uh, quick start owner's manual this should come with a USB cable software CD the cartridge, the turntable, obviously, the platter, counterweight, a 45 RPM adapter, and the slip mat, all of which, well, some of which we've already gone ahead and taken out and discovered. Now, one thing I noticed right off the bat is that this is a very light turntable. It's made almost entirely out of plastic, which goes without saying for a turntable of this age. It was made in July of 2008. However, it's actually a, not, not a bad model. It does have an actual metal tone arm here which will be very nice for queuing up records. For some reason, for whatever reason, the seller thought it a good idea to leave the stylus and leave this, this tone arm unsecured. So I really hope that the stylus is okay because I don't have a replacement one on hand right now. You have two start and stop buttons, both of which will start and engage the turntable mechanism, the, the, the motor. We have a speed selector here, 433 and 45 RPM records your eighth inch stereo line in jack very useful to have that again I was under the impression that this was an actual headphone jack so that is I would have preferred a headphone jack but that will be probably used in the future for when I need to record line level sources 
in rather high quality. Hopefully the USB sound card and the digital to analog converters that are present in this turntable are not all that low quality. We have a power button up here. I'm a bit partial to the tone arm style that's present on this particular turntable as opposed to just a straight turntable that a lot of newer, cheaper USB turntables are using and employing in their design. So it's a nice it's a nice change which definitely is reminiscent of the older Technics model turntables that everyone seems to want. Unlike the ATL P60, you do have a counterweight here. Very nice to see this. And another little bonus is the anti-skate control which is present on this unit. I finally figured out how this locking mechanism is supposed to work. It was actually bent and uh, beyond the point at which it's supposed to stop. I fixed that now and it does a good job at locking the tone arm. So this will be nice if I need to transport this around. I won't need to worry about the tone arm swinging around and ruining the stylus. Unlike the ATL P60, there's not much in the way of input and outputs on the rear of the unit. They're actually located conspicuously on the underside of the turntable. We have the RCA line level jacks a switch for enabling or disabling the built-in phono preamp, a gain control which will be very useful for controlling the gain. I, I, I would like to, I'd assume that that is for controlling the output volume which is sent over USB, although it might very well be for the RCA line output. So I'll have to do some, some before and after tests using the gain control. And again, you can see and take in this turntable's plastic cheapness. It, it certainly is not the epitome of well-built and durable turntables, but it should get you by, especially if you want to do a minor upgrade. I mean, the ATL P60 is fully plastic except for the platter, so it's really not much of a difference. Now, the way in which you were to go about putting a platter on this turntable is done much the same way it's accomplished on any other turntable, any belt-driven turntable, that is. Simply put the platter over the spindle, the center spindle, and then put your finger over the rubber belt and position it such that it is making good contact with the motor spindle, which is the case here. And I think we're ready to go ahead and test this turntable. Hopefully everything works just fine on it. I have a jury-rigged setup here with the turntable resting on its box as a sort of table. And one of these iHome FM radios and, and iPod players, but it has a line in jack. And I was able to connect up the line level source from this turntable up to its input. And I just noticed that this turntable did not come with a 45 adapter, so I'll have to scrounge around and perhaps look for the one that came with my ATL P60. Unless, of course, the seller, unless it's thrown in here somewhere. No, but I don't believe I see it, so I'll have to, have to steal the one off my ATL P60 right now. So I guess we'll go ahead and do a demonstration of the 45 RPM playback first. And we're playing the Jackson 5 ABC, so let's hope we don't run into copyright snafus. I should probably get down to an adequate position to cue this up properly without damaging the record. So, make sure that this is turned up to a decent volume. Of course, it's complaining of a low battery. Unlock the turntable, or the tone arm. Hopefully this should play now. Let's take a listen. Oh, that's nice. It stops relatively quick. I wonder if it has a braking mechanism integrated into it. And here we are now, almost a week since I began this video. A few things came up that precluded my finishing this video. But here, uh, no, talent, no time like the present, so I've decided to whip out the camera. And I'm actually using the, the DCR TRV103 from 1999 to finish this video. And the one thing that I just noticed upon turning this turntable on for the first time in a week is that it does not remember the speed at which you had it set prior to powering it off. So, for example, if I power this on and set it to 45 RPM, and I power it off now, and power it back on yet again, it goes back to 33 and a third revolutions per minute. So it's not a minor, it's not a major issue, it's something of a minor annoyance, but it's something you do need to keep in mind, especially if you power off the turntable frequently, 
The only letdown that I have with this turntable is their decision to go ahead and introduce and use an actual plastic platter. Aside from being very cheap, it doesn't really help in the noise and rumble department that magnetic cartridges are certainly prone to. The Newmark branded version of his turntable, that's essentially the exact same turntable just with the Newmark brand, has an actual aluminum platter and a pitch adjustment over in this blank area. So aside from that, it's essentially the very same turntable that you could buy from Newmark. There's a few people who have had good luck replacing the head shell, the cartridge, and stylus that this turntable uses, but I've noticed that it performs admirably well with LPs and 45s. It has a very, very decent amount of high-end and low-end frequency response, and it's not at all worn out, which is thankful, which is quite nice, because I, w I did buy this turntable used, but the original seller had mentioned that he only used it for a handful of times, just to transfer a few out of print LPs that he had in his collection. Anything that's connected up to this 8th inch stereo jack, a 3.5mm stereo jack, does not get output over the RCA connections. It only gets converted to digital and streamed over USB for conversion purposes. And as mentioned earlier, you have two start and stop buttons. One up here, but I guess that can serve to be convenient in some scenarios. For me, it's a bit awkwardly placed, so I end up using this. It starts and stops rather quickly. Interestingly, I wonder if this is some sort of a crude strobe. I don't think so. However, it has that look. I don't know, but it seems to be playing at pretty much spot on 33 and a third and 45 RPM speeds with no intervention necessary by me. I'd like to know why they called or felt the need to put GT on the cartridge. I have no clue what that could stand for. The output of this mixer goes into this three input AV switch box. The yellow output is not being used for anything. I just have it connected so I don't have a hanging wire there. And I have three separate devices, a CD player, the ATLP60 turntable, and this ION TT USB turntable, which is connected as a third input. And that is because my mixer, a Behringer Xenix 802, does not have enough line level inputs to support all the devices I wish to connect to it. Having said that, however, I will be able to simply turn up its input, switch this to the correct input that the turntable outputs its audio through, and be able to record in Audacity. Now one thing I thought I should probably point out before doing the actual tests of this turntable, and something that should certainly be taken into consideration if you're planning on using this turntable for any sort of a DJ environment or a radio type environment where you need to queue up the records in advance and have them ready to play whenever you're actually needing to do so. If you play a record on it, and of course it didn't come with a 45 RPM adapter, it should, but this being a used turntable it does not. If I go ahead and place a 45 on here, power this on, and rest the tone arm on the record after getting it queued up to the position I want it to play. There's going to be some hum and noise that makes its way into the audio. So what I'll do now is turn up the speakers and it'll become readily apparent to those of you listening through headphones or even a good pair of speakers that this is picking up a decent amount of hum. We're actually getting some feedback from the speakers. However, even listening through headphones, the hum is very noticeable, even when having the gain setting at a relatively conservative volume. Now, granted, when you're playing vinyl or using this for casual listening purposes, it's not going to be all that noticeable. But if you're doing some sort of a radio show such as I do, and you're going to have the fader turned up as you're announcing the song, and then you're getting ready to play, you're definitely going to pick up on that hum that's making its way into the audio. You notice right now, there's no vinyl playing. It's picking up a bit of my voice. I can hear a slight echo. That's typical for magnetic cartridges. However, even when I'm not speaking, it's still picking up that hum. However, if you're just doing casual listening and playing and queuing up your records the way that most people are accustomed to doing with automatic turntables of, of, of another type, whereas the platter begins spinning and you drop the stylus on as the platter's moving, the sound of the vinyl does obscure that hum. And another little thing that I noticed, a bit of a caveat if you will, is whatever the components that are used in this turntable are not subject to decent shielding. Because I've noticed as you put this cartridge in the stylus closer to the 
center of this platter, there's an appreciable increase in the amount of interference and noise that makes its way into the audio chain. Granted, you're not going to be playing records in this fashion, but it's just to prove a point here. Let me turn this up a bit more. You can probably hear that that hum is a lot more noticeable now. That's coming from some sort of a poorly shielded electronic component. The sound is akin to what you would receive if you had some sort of a cheap, improperly shielded power supply alongside some sort of an audio cable. And if you'll notice now, and listen carefully, as I move the stylus farther and farther away from the center of this turntable's platter, the noise vanishes. So there's some sort of a component right over in this area that's very poorly shielded and introduces a significant amount of hum and noise into the audio. Again, not all that noticeable if you're playing vinyl, but even on the lead-out grooves on a relatively clean 45 or LP with a very, very small amount of crackles and pops, you're going to start picking up on that hum right away. And now for this next portion of the demonstration of this turntable's capabilities of playing back vinyl, I am going to directly hook you up to the mixer's output so as to give you the best quality possible when it comes to listening and deciphering for yourself whether or not this turntable would be a decent fit for you. And before I play any music, I want you to notice, I'm going to connect you up directly to the mixer's output, and I want you to listen to the amount of noise that becomes very noticeable and very apparent as I move the stylus closer to the center of the platter. And so now, without further ado, I will go ahead and patch you into the mixer. I'm not going to really waste my time playing any LPs because there's really no need to do so. If this can play 45s, it can most certainly play LPs. And if it can sound good playing 45s, it can most certainly play LPs and sound good at the same time. Again, the only letdowns I have to say that I experienced and, and had with this turntable was its decision or their decision to include a plastic turntable platter, the lack and loss of a pitch control, and aside from that, I really don't have any major problems with this turntable. Of course, that hum is very noticeable. I'm really not too sure what's causing that. But whatever it is, is located right around this portion of the platter itself. Because if, as you may or may not have heard, when I was moving this stylus closer to the center, or even placing it on the 45, the leading groove, you can definitely tell that there is a lot of hum there. And it's not all that noticeable in real life. It is there. But if you're running it through any sort of audio processing program on the computer side or any analog processing or even AGC, such as this camcorder applies to anything plugged into its mic input, it's going to start becoming very noticeable, which is rather unfortunate. The ATLP60 does not have that problem whatsoever. Because I'm just a total glutton for punishment and really want to push my luck with YouTube's content ID, let's go ahead and try to play John Waits Missing You. Every time I think of you 